Uh, Dr. Mitch Katz, who's going to be speaking this morning, is the director of the LA Health Agency, which houses the second largest municipal health services system in the United States, along with the county mental health system and traditional public health services. His agency has a budget of $8 billion, with a B, uh, and 30,000 employees. He's especially passionate about creating patient-centered primary care homes, housing the homeless, diverting the seriously mentally ill and addicted persons from jail to treatment. Dr. Katz practices as a primary care doctor at Roy Ball Comprehensive Health Center and attends on the inpatient medicine wards at three of his acute care hospitals. Dr. Katz. Good morning, everyone. It sounds like someone already got uh, put into service to give a plenary, so I'm glad I didn't make anyone else have to do a plenary unexpected. Um, I love primary care and primary care providers, and I thought actually I would start by reflecting a little bit about my own journey on primary care, because it was not at all uh, what I expected. So I trained in a primary care internal medicine program and all I ever wanted to do was to be a primary care doctor. But it was San Francisco and it was the 80s, which were the darkest years of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And so I became a primary care AIDS doctor. Uh, and it certainly was primary care in the sense that uh, we met all of the patients' needs when they had other illnesses besides HIV and AIDS, like diabetes or hypertension. We took care of them. And it was very much uh, a beginning of illness, sadly, to a pretty short end of illness with death and dying. And I had many of the conversations um, about end of life that people in other areas are just beginning to have. And Certainly, HIV AIDS was way ahead of itself as a movement in terms of uh, patient-centeredness and including the patient in decisions and valuing their choices uh, since it was such a, a dramatic time. So I, I was a primary care AIDS doctor, um, but one thing about it was that as soon as somebody came into the room, I already knew the diagnosis. Right, I was in the HIV AIDS clinic. And in that sense, it was not like general medicine uh, at all. When I moved to Los Angeles six years ago, I had to leave my primary care practice and say goodbye uh, to many patients, which any of you who have done transitions in your work life know how difficult that is, how hard it is to say goodbye. There are a couple of patients of mine who still six years later send me emails and um, that kind of connection is the special thing about primary care. But when I got to Los Angeles, I wanted to continue my medical practice. So I thought that I would go work in the HIV AIDS clinic, which I did. But because of the changes in the epidemic and I didn't have a, an established practice, they didn't really need me that much. So. Uh, after I did a couple of sessions, none of which were very busy, none of which I felt like I really had much of a role, I said, well, I'm going to go back to being a general internist. So I, I went to uh, where I work now, to Roybal, which is a, a clinic in East LA. Um, everybody happily speaks Spanish. Um, all business in East LA is conducted in Spanish. All signs are in Spanish. You, you never hear English. Occasionally, you know, I say buenas tardes to uh, one of my patients and they somewhat grumpily say hello, right? So we sort of have the opposite of the usual case where you start speaking English and the person doesn't understand what you're saying. Um, but what was so interesting to me was how hard it was to be a generalist. Uh, after all those years of knowing the diagnosis before someone came in, after all those years of feeling like within this field of HIV AIDS, I knew, well, nobody knows everything, but within the clinical focus, I knew 
like almost everything there was to know that would affect my patients. People would come and ask me, you know, Mitch, what would you do in this situation? What would you do in that situation if the person wasn't in HIV clinic? When I, would, when I would attend on the wards, I would know so much more about the HIV patients than other people, right? I, I sort of had the, the credo of a specialist. And all of a sudden, I was pushed back on my old instincts, and I had to cope with the fact that people would come in, and in East LA, generally people haven't gotten much medical care. This is not a practice where people are coming in because their LDL moved up two units, and now they're really concerned, right? People come in with illnesses where uh, a frequent question that I ask is, the reason you came today as opposed to two weeks ago is, right, and often the answer is because I was working, uh, because I have no sick leave. Uh, one guy, because I was driving a truck for the last several days. Um, so people come with very serious illness, but of course, like any primary care practice, people also come with psychological illness. So you, the person walking in may be having a heart attack. The person walking in may have a broken heart. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm back not only feeling, oh my God, how much there is to know in primary care, how hard this is uh, compared to being a specialist, but maybe also this is why I like primary care doctors, right? When you become a specialist, I think it's very easy after a while, you know, to feel like you're such a smart person because people are always asking you these questions and you know the answer and you have all this obscure knowledge and when you're suddenly thrown back on yourself, and what you have is your ability to relate to your patients, your ability to remember that even when you don't know what's wrong with them, you can always offer comfort. You can always offer that sense of connection. Um, that's really special. I'm very glad to be back uh, to being a, a true primary care doctor. Um, you might have wondered in the title why I would talk about um, hospitals in a talk about primary care. Uh, well, when the legendary bank robber Willie Sutton was asked by FBI agents why he robbed banks, he said, because that's where the money is. Um, so one of the, the themes that I want us to think about in this, the time we have together is how we as primary care doctors help hospitals, especially safety net hospitals the hospitals that are most likely to be caring for people affected by health reform, how we help them do a better job and they in turn help us to do a better job by sending some of the money that would otherwise get spent on hospitals to primary care. So quick review, which actually happens all the time um, when I'm on the wards, the question of what do people need from hospitals? You know, sometimes people say, well, this, I say to my residents, why is this patient in the hospital? And they say, oh, well, he's really sick. I'm like, well, really sick is not a reason to be in a hospital. What, what is it that they need from the hospital? So we think of hospitals, places to send people with urgent care, emergency departments. Uh, sometimes people really do have inpatient stays. Well, I'm not a, a great fan of inpatient hospital uh, compared to outpatient. I've always felt that outpatient is where the money is in the sense of the meaning of, of being a doctor, the sense of somebody's life. Sometimes hospitals are amazing. Uh, last year when I was attending at all of you, uh, a 85-year-old woman came in to the hospital and basically could only lift her head and couldn't even um, say her name. She kind of mouthed her name and then fell back into her stupor. Uh, she turned out to have urinary sepsis and the next day she was up in her bed knitting. It's like, wow, if that were always what inpatient hospitalization was like, I would work in the hospital more. Um, but that isn't mostly what it's like, um, mostly um, the, the really major things go on in primary care. Advanced diagnostics are a major reason we, we send people to hospitals. Specialty care, 
huge, uh, especially if you're taking care, as I do, and many of you do, very low-income people, where private specialists are unlikely to be willing to see people in our country, uh, in the U.S., under Medicaid. Um, you know, it's a, a different and, I'd like to say, better system in Canada, uh, but certainly here, uh, very hard to get a Medicaid patient to a private doctor's office with specialty care and surgery. Um, under health reform uh, at the moment um, in the U.S., uh, pa patients have choice. That was very different for a system like mine, Los Angeles County system, uh, where uh, for a long time most of our patients had no insurance. Uh, but the choice may be very limited for specialty care and thus the need to better engage hospitals. Um, what do hospitals um, need from primary care? Well, they need from us access to uh, being able to see their patients in a longitudinal way. Uh, so this was a very, especially this and the next one, confidence and follow-up. When I first got to LA, which was overwhelmingly the most hospital-dominated system certainly I had ever worked in. In fact, uh, six years ago, there was no ambulatory care system in Los Angeles. This huge uh, multi-billion dollar system, whatever clinics uh, there were, they were under the hospital, they were run by the hospital, um, and you never get very good primary care uh, if there aren't primary care leaders, which there weren't. So when I talked to emergency doctors, I was reviewing a case of somebody who had an abdominal CT scan 40 times in the prior two to three years, uh, each time they went to the emergency department. So I, I quizzed one of the emergency uh, department doctors who I liked the most. I knew he's a very smart, excellent doctor, very caring. Like, why, why do they keep getting a CT scan at your hospital's emergency department? You're the chair. You know, isn't this something that you can change? And he said to me, if you guarantee me that this patient will be seen, I won't do it. But if I'm the emergency room doctor and I don't have any primary care, and that was certainly the situation in Los Angeles six years ago, then my responsibility to the patient is to make sure that there's nothing seriously wrong with them. So the system sort of reinforces itself um, as this very acute care system. Our hospitals also uh, need help for our patients who are suffering from what I like to think of as the social ICU, right? People who are homeless, uh, people who don't have enough food, people who are not getting the benefits they should. They're dealing with violence in their families. They've experienced violence in their life. They're dealing with addictions. They have difficulty taking their medicines. So uh, if, if that's what hospitals need from primary care and what primary care needs from hospitals, uh, what was the LA uh, public system like in 2011? Well, if you needed a CT scan for a patient, let's say, because it looked like from the chest x-ray that they had cancer, you needed a cardiology consult because the person seemed to have worsening uh, angina, you needed an open uh, biopsy for a patient. I had a patient with a, a large uh, mass off his jaw. So what you did was, I learned, and this was very different um, than the San Francisco system, where I worked with one of your leaders, uh, Dr. Kevin Grumbach, you sent them to the emergency room. It was fascinating to me because, I mean, here we're not talking about 30 years ago. This is 2011. So by 2011, most systems, you know, were already handing out refrigerator magnets saying, you know, don't go to the emergency department, call the nurse advice line, you know, see your doctor. 2011, the doctors were telling the patients, go to the emergency department. Uh, no, I would send, when I first, when I'm talking about that patient with the mass, I said, you know, I was very new in 
primary care at Roybal, and I'm like, well, so what do I do? This patient needs an open biopsy. So, oh, well, you can't get an open biopsy. Like, what do you mean I can't get an open biopsy? The guy has a mass so large, you can see it across from the room. He needs an open biopsy. They said, we have to send him to the emergency room. It's like, well, but it's not an emergency. It's like, well, but there is no outpatient biopsy service. Um, so everybody um, went to the emergency room. And so the, the negative cycle um, that it created, which I have worked very hard um, in Los Angeles to change, is the person goes to the emergency department, where of course we spend uh, a ton of resources, right? Both because emergency departments are expensive and then often we admit them and they get other diagnostic tests and people feel that because they, they won't get primary care, they have to get everything there. And then you turn around when I said uh, coming on to fix the system, work on the system, well, why is there no primary care? Because it said, we don't have any money. There's not enough money. You need to get money for primary care. That's your job, Mitch. You, you need to get money for primary care. Go tell the Board of Supervisors that they need better funding. I'm like, well, my first thought was, you know, I'm not sure, but $3 billion seems like a lot of money. You know, can't we do something with $3 billion? You know, isn't, isn't it possible to maybe open up a little storefront or something? Um, you know, it would seem, but the, the triage, even aside from money, even like for the advanced diagnostics, where it wasn't money so much, the issue, if I had a patient who needed, say, a CT scan or an MRI scan, everybody understood that the hospital, the triage was the emergency department goes first, then the inpatient service, and then the outpatient service. And there was never any sense that, well, the person's need would determine what order the person went. So because of this, people in the emergency department would get CT scans for things that would make me laugh. You know, what, you got a CT scan for that? Right, well, people on the inpatient service even would wait for days to get the CT scan because all of the people in the scanner were coming from the emergency department. And again, the money gets wasted, right, as the person sits in the hospital waiting for the CT scan. And then outpatient was just felt to be a prayer. You know, the instructions were you could send in the, the requisition, but it would be unlikely to happen. If your patient really needed a CT scan, send them to the ED, where they would get the CT scan. So a very, a very backwards thing. So, you know, how, how do you change this? One way or another, you have to get hospitals to invest in primary care. Uh, the work that I've done in the last five years in LA was just particularly extreme. But it, it, it exists every day. It, certainly it exists every day in this country, and I think to a lesser extent, it does still exist in Canada. That, that the expenses naturally go to the hospital where things are more expensive. And again, I don't want anyone, any of you uh, to think that I'm negative on hospitals. Again, I mean, I, my system has four hospitals, I'm very proud of them, but I only want them to be used for what hospitals are needed for. I don't want them to be doing things that should be done in the outpatient. I want hospitals to take care of acutely ill people who need intensive monitoring or who need oxygen and multiple intravenous medications, right? Those are the people I want in the hospital. Everybody else I want out of the hospital and I want them in primary care. And in order for that to happen, um, we need people to move the money uh, from the hospitals uh, to our primary care. Now, hospitals, of course, this is not, in fact, a one-way street. Uh, hospitals stand to benefit tremendously from great primary care. Uh, why? Because there are decreases in hospital readmission rates, which in this country uh, result in higher penalties. There are avoidance of unnecessary days uh, in the hospital, uh, especially if people are there only because no one has faith that there is a 
a loving primary care doctor out there who will watch them, uh, as well as avoiding uh, unnecessary admissions. Um, now, as we'll talk more, all of this does depend on how things are financed. Uh, once I remember talking to a hospital executive who ran a university-based hospital, and I was talking to him about uh, the literature on unnecessary scanning. It's an issue that I particularly bothers me because when we do unnecessary scanning, we not only pick up a variety of incidental findings that typically trouble our patients and subject them to more invasive procedures later on, but we're also uh, radiating them. When you radiate people enough, at least on a population basis, you cause cancer. So here we have this test looking for cancer that causes cancer. Not to say a CT scan isn't valuable when the person really needs it, but there are all these scans. So when I talked to him about it, he said, you know, you're right, Mitch, but if there were a 20% decrease of CT scanning in my hospital, my hospital would no longer break even because the reimbursement rates were so, were so good on procedures compared to other things. So, so the general theory of we can move the money does depend on how our hospitals and our overall system are financed. Um, in terms of making this relationship work, um, certainly at the, the hallmark is having a, a patient-centered primary care home. Right? Patients have to have a place where they can go. Uh, I don't need to tell all of you this. Your society has been active in the researching this, in the development of this, in the creation of this. I'll only tell you that as someone who worked for many years as a doctor in San Francisco where uh, maybe because of Kevin and others, this principal, uh, Tom Bodenheimer, was very strong. When I came to LA, I, was like, I felt like I was on Mars. Uh, I would say to people, well, you know, uh, we need primary care homes. And they said to me, oh, no, that, that won't work here. You know, even, even in the outpatient clinics, if in 2011, if you saw Dr. X uh, on, you know, week one and you had to come back, week two you might see nurse practitioner Y on the second week. And the third week you might see Dr. Z. Uh, and they felt that was completely normal outpatient care. Uh, there was no systematic impanelment. Um, nobody had a regular provider. There are two funny reactions that I got when I started pushing for it. We've now, by the way, impaneled 450,000 people to a specific primary care home. So that, that's the fun you can have in a place like LA. Well, thank you. It, you know, it helps to have uh, a county of 10 million people, right? In, in San Francisco, it would not have been possible to impanel 450,000 people because there are only 700,000 people who live in the whole county, right? But in LA has an amazing magnitude. Two funny reactions to my campaign towards impaneling people. The first was, Mitch, you don't understand. Uh, most of our patients are seen by residents. They can't have a, a patient panel. I said, really? You know, that's funny, because in 1986, when I started internship, they handed me a list of all my patients, right? I had inherited them from the R3 who had graduated, and her practice, you know, was separated into all of the different interns. I said, well, isn't that strange that in 1986, I had a panel, and, and here that's impossible. Second reaction, uh, this was from a, an attending level doctor. Um, I'm talking about primary care homes and, and why I believe in them. Um, and he gave me actually quite a lot of insight into why it didn't happen. He said, well, but it sounds like, Mitch, you expect us to be in charge of all the patient's issues. Like, yes, that, that's actually quite right. Um, and without being, you know, too cynical, I do understand that in, when you're in a dysfunctional system, 
where there isn't a team and there aren't the resources uh, our computer system in LA in, in 2011 had already sunset. So there were, there were no updates being done by the vendor any longer. There was, there was no co convenient charting system. Um, we, we found somewhere along the line uh, a drawer that was full of paper consults that had never been done, never been seen. Obviously someone got the consult and they just put it in the drawer, closed the drawer. You know, it's a very efficient way of, of dealing with it. Uh, you, get, you get a lot of consults done in a very short time. Um, the, it's scary. I'm, to be honest, again, between the fact that I was not used to being a true primary care doctor in 2011 and working in a system where primary care doctors had almost no support, uh, I was frightened. Uh, the first time I had somebody uh, I remember who had you know, several chronic illnesses. I was seeing them in urgent care. They had diabetes, uh, hypertension. Um, they had congestive heart failure and I'm like, you know, this person needs a, a, a doctor. And they're like, I'm sorry, we don't have doctors, you know, here that can see people like that. I'm like, really? This is an outpatient center we don't have? I mean, this is not like a, the worried well. It's like, no, so, but now we do. Um, we have e-consult, which I'm, I want to tell you a little bit more about in the next slides, which fixed our referral problem. And we're working on how we make a, a major difference in the area of of social needs. So um, I told you about the impanelment. Um, clearly another feature of any primary care home is a registry, um, which uh, we had a non-functional one. We'll soon have one that will actually work. Everyone working at the, the top of their license, which was a major issue in LA where, for example, registered nurses were used to the idea that they did vital signs and they put patients in rooms. And that was their job. Um, and uh, the, the nice thing is that when you approach people in a positive mission driven way, we need, our patients need help. Our patients need somebody to coordinate their care. Um, we need nurses to go beyond what they've done previously in Los Angeles and really help to manage patients. We've had good success. Not everyone. Some people really wanted to put patients in rooms. Um, and we've had more difficulty getting them. But again, if you, my, my belief uh, uh, from years of working in civil service systems is that mission does work. You can get people to focus on their mission. Uh, we're not yet at electronic health record with notifications, which uh, is one of the things I feel a loss. Uh, uh, in, uh, when I left uh, the San Francisco system six years ago, I was routinely receiving notifications. Your patient is in the emergency department. Um, your patient is in outpatient. I, I'm curious, how many of you I just, I'd like to know how far behind we are in LA. Can you show me with a, a hand raising, how many of you will get a message if your primary care patient is in the emergency department or somewhere else? Yeah, so, well, I guess I don't f need to feel quite as bad. Well, wait here, uh, I don't know how many of you are researchers. How many of you are working as clinicians like me and are currently working in a system that doesn't do that? Yeah, see, we're still quite behind. So the San Francisco system was doing it six years ago, but we, we still don't have the ability. I think we will have it in the next six months. But that, that's in terms of the work, that's huge. I mean, I used to routinely call up the emergency department when I get those notices and say, send them home, right? Put him on the phone, right? I would talk to the patient for a little while and then send them home, right? Um, the, many times people panic. Uh, one of my, my current patients has hepatitis C um, and every time he, and anxiety, which is the, you primary care doctors know, the, the worst combination is really serious illness and 
a great deal of anxiety, right? So, so when he gets scared from his hepatitis C, which is easy to get scared from because it's, he has uncompensated uh, cirrhosis, he goes to the emergency department um, where they almost always admit him for one day and tell him that he needs a liver transplant. Uh, and he comes back and tells me, the doctor said I need a liver transplant. I'm like, yes, 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 we're, we're working on your plan, right? His plan will be medications uh, for the time being. Uh, but uh, if, if I had a system where I knew when he went, um, I think that might be different. Um, E-consult uh, for us has been huge. I told you about the issue with the referrals in the drawer that we found. Um, we, the, I also was beseeched when I first came because someone brought me an appointment slip for my system uh, to show me that the next cardiology appointment was in nine months. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I don't know much about the system and maybe arguably some people would say I don't know that much about cardiology. Uh, but I know that there's no point in giving someone an appointment for cardiology in nine months. Right. Either the person needs to be seen by a cardiologist or the person doesn't need to be seen. But nine months uh, makes no sense. Um, so we went to this e-consult system. Uh, we're, and, and again, I love the, the, the fun of the LA numbers. So we're transmitting 52,000 electronic consultations every quarter. Every three months, 52,000 consults go between my primary care doctors, including me, um, and our specialists. Um, and uh, overall, about a, th a third of the time, we don't need a visit. That's our experience, is that about a third of the time, the specialists can tell us what to do as primary care doctors. It's been a huge success because it makes us as primary care doctors better, right? Because we learn what to do in certain difficult situations that we may not have encountered before, but which we may encounter again. Um, the, the specialists like it because they used to get referrals when those paper referrals ever actually resulted in a visit, right? The orthopedic surgeon would get a piece of paper that would say back pain. Right, or you know, thyroid function abnormal, please evaluate. Right, and often the person wouldn't have even had the basic workup, so the first consult visit would be totally wasted, where the person would first send the person back to get the test. So now not only did we eliminate all those first visits where the specialist can tell the primary care doctor, uh, start this medication and consult me back if it doesn't work, but we also eliminated all the wasted visits um, that came from the fact that people didn't necessarily have the appropriate workup. Our specialists like it, uh, we give them uh, credit. So instead of doing a session, they do a certain number of e-consults, which they can then do whenever they want, because it's all electronic. Many of them now do them on their telephones. Uh, so if you, ha you have to, you're a specialist, you're a hematologist, you got to pick up your kid at 3 o'clock. You can shorten your week, pick up your kid at 3 o'clock, and after you've brought her home, then you can do your uh, e-consult. So they like it because it gives them some flexible time that doesn't require being in their office. Uh, when, they're, when they're working. We're up to 64 specialists. And again, we have now uh, over 4,000 primary care doctors because we include in our system not just us as uh, the civil servant doctors, but all of the primary care doctors who work in federally qualified health centers in Los Angeles. Why? Because if you work in federally qualified health centers, you know they're great for primary care, but if the person needs specialty, they don't have it. So you need a referral. So in the old days, what would they do? They'd send the patient to the emergency room, right? Because th that was their only choice. So now by including them in our uh, e-consult system, uh, I'm able to prevent all of those emergency uh, visits. 
uh, it brought just one, you're a group of researchers, uh, uh, many of you, so I brought you one, one small paper that uh, got published in Urology, looking at a, was uh, just a project of a, a RWJ scholar during his year, um, where he looked at cases where a patient had microscopic hematuria, uh, how long did it take to get to a definitive workup uh, before he consult 239 days, after he consult 170 days. Uh, and this was pretty early on in our experience. I suspect now it would be even faster. Another way we've done, we've tried to do the, the tremendous numbers and, uh, uh, is through teleretinal screening. Um, so uh, let me, again, let, let me get a sense of uh, your practices. How many of you who are clinically practicing uh, have access to teleretinal screening for your diabetic patients? Not so many. Um, so, you know, he, this is an intervention which really needs to come to prime time, and I'm not sure why it's moved uh, as slowly as it has. So we, we as primary care doctors, we're usually the ones caring for our diabetics. We want our diabetics to get annual eye exams, right? That's part of good care uh, in Los Angeles, and I suspect in many places, but I know the data in Los Angeles, diabetes is the number one cause of preventable blindness. Um, so again, in this huge system that I found, the waiting times were months and months for people with eye disease. So how do you fix months and months of wait for eye disease when you have all these diabetic patients who need to be screened? And the answer was they weren't getting screened. Um, so do you just hire a bunch more ophthalmologists? Well, again, I wasn't even sure, not only did I have the money issue, but I wasn't even sure I could attract that many ophthalmologists who wanted to work in a county system. So a very smart, uh, also RWJ in Los Angeles, um, told me about this retinal screening project. I had read a little bit about it. And I told her, well, but if we do this, I'm not interested in a pilot. I want this to be how we do retinal screening. Um, because I've already seen the data to show that you can do it as a pilot. Um, so we now have done uh, about 34,000 screenings uh, using the camera. It's pretty amazing if you don't work in a practice. So you can teach any level of person who can hold a camera in a couple of hours how to do the picture. Patient comes in, it can be after a visit or you can set up a, a clinic just for the person to come. They sit down picture taken, then in our case, the picture is read uh, distantly, because there's no reason to have somebody there, and it costs us $20 per image read. Um, so in terms of my costs, you know, hugely less than it would cost me to create an ophthalmology visit. Uh, one of the things you learn quickly when you run systems like mine is this tremendous cost in a visit other than the doctor or provider. There's just the make the appointment, register the person, put them in a room, clean the room, send the person out. Um, so here there's none of that. Um, and uh, what we found is that 70% of the images, and these are only, we only do this for diabetics, right? So 70% of the images of diabetics come back normal, which makes sense. And so only 30% of the patients have to go to ophthalmology. And not only have I saved 70% of the visits to ophthalmology, but the 30% that go, we now know why they're going. So if they were just, if they actually had been sent to ophthalmology as a referral, the way it would have once been done, the first visit would have been to a general ophthalmologist. So now if the picture shows that they need a laser treatment, the first treatment um, will be um, a laser treatment. So I actually also save there. 
So uh, I, I raise these as, as examples of their close outpatient hospital coordination because the actual ophthalmology visits all occur in my system at, at hospitals. Again, I know if you're taking care of people in our country with Medicare, uh, you can get them to see a private ophthalmologist. But in my world, that's not going to happen. My patients are either uninsured, even under the current health reform, because they're undocumented, or they're Medicaid. Um, the, the final frontier uh, for us is really doing housing um, and other, addressing other social needs. So we've now, in the last three years, we've housed 2,000 people um, as a health department. So LA has housing. LA does fair housing. LA does uh, supportive housing by nonprofit. What we're doing is we're taking people who are stuck in the hospital who can't leave or who would otherwise be admitted to the hospital from primary care because they're homeless and have chronic illnesses that, that make it impossible for them to survive on the street and we're housing them. And the money is coming from the hospital system to return to my earlier theme, right? The, the hospitals, when I have a patient at uh, one of my hospitals who is there only because they are homeless and they would die on the street because they're not yet well enough, I get paid uh, by the federal government zero because it's a denied day, not inappropriately in a sense. The, the federal government says, well, why is this patient, what is the acute care reason that the patient is in the hospital? And the answer is, I have no acute care reason the patient's in the hospital. The patient would go home if they had a home, but they don't have a home, so they're here in the hospital. So that's a denied day. So I get no reimbursement, but I still have all of my costs of keeping them in the hospital, nurse ratios, medications. So if I move that person to housing, I now save in the hospital, and I save whether or not the I decrease the need for the bed, or I save because the new person in the bed now has a source of reimbursement. So if I can not go on diversion because I've emptied my hospitals, so now I can take in more patients who have a source of reimbursement, uh, I also get paid. So we've moved people in our most uh, startling one. We, we had a, a very unusual opening of a building. Um, Call, uh, called the Star Apartments for us, where we were opening 120 units at one time, and we literally moved 120 people from our largest hospital, LAC USC, to the building. Everybody came off the inpatient service or out of the emergency room where many of them were living in the waiting room um, because they had no place. So I, I'm a big believer that these problems, which sometimes seem you know, intransible, will never get enough money, there'll never be enough money to house people, we actually have the money. We just have the money in the wrong place. And our job is to figure out, as primary care people who really understand uh, the needs of our patients, how to do that. Um, you know the literature on food insecurity. Several of you have written that literature. Um, it's, it's another example of where um, we're writing the wrong prescription, right? For the homeless person, the prescription we need to write is not just the antibiotics for the wounds, it's the house. Uh, for the diabetic who doesn't have a predictable source of food, the prescription that we should be writing is not just for the insulin, it's for the food. Um, and I'm very interested in uh, the area of financial benefits because I think it's a, a very wise opportunity to try to leverage money again that's in the system. If people are not on food stamps, if people are not getting the earned uh, worker credit, if people are not getting social security benefits, it's a huge opportunity to improve somebody's life. I'm not sure how much 
uh, I'm gonna, I wanna talk about macro given our, uh, our current federal system. I, I, I put it on because I, I think if any group uh, were interested in how we provide value, um, it would be this group. Although, you know, my first thought, you know, on macro was that it existed to make all consultants richer than anyone uh, because nobody really knew what macro was. Uh, macro also makes all clinicians really anxious uh, because while we know that we deliver value as primary care doctors, we're not, it, we're worried that people don't always appreciate uh, uh, what value is. And here I have to tell you uh, a story about uh, my favorite couple that I, I take care of. So I take care of these two people, both of whom married, both of whom have diabetes, both of whom are Spanish speaking. Um, they're incredibly lovely people. Um, they just, as I saw them just uh, Thursday, um, they're, they're very attached to me. Uh, you'll see why that becomes important. They, they told me, I'm very flattered, that I was a blessing to them, right? Only issue is I've never once got either of their hemoglobin A1Cs below 9.5. Never once. Will they see a different doctor? No, absolutely not. Do they follow anything that I tell them? No, absolutely not. I mean, we all have patients like this, right? They, they absolutely love us. Not that they would listen to anything we would suggest, um, but they're, they're attached, right? So I, I always imagine, right, like the, the you know, the audit you know, uh, you know, Mitch Katz's, you know, diabetic patients, right? You know, oh yeah, you know, he's the, you know, the system guy, yeah, you know, his patients can't even get under 9.5 on their hemoglobin A1Cs. Um, but uh, MACRA really stands for Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, um, which is meant to be uh, value-based purchasing in one way or another. And I definitely don't want to get into the minutia of what value. Uh, really what I want to say, uh, and this is my last slide, and we'll leave the, the time because for your comments and thoughts, is that the medical system, certainly the American medical system, and, and from what I know, the Canadian system, which I feel has a lot of advantages, but also challenges, it can be a lot better. Both systems can be a lot better. For them to be better, the people who have to be driving the change have to be the primary care providers because we are the ones who actually know what our patients need. Um, and unless the system is focused on that, it won't work. So I'm all for value-based systems but I'm in favor of the, the value being determined by all of you who see your patients and work on the issues uh, that are closest to their heart and are the people they call when they're unsure or they're uncertain or they're feeling ill um, and who show that part of the value that we provide as primary care doctors is what we give of ourselves and of the relationships that we form. Uh, things that are harder to capture sometimes than someone's hemoglobin A1C levels. Thank you very much. And they, they don't have to be questions. They can be comments, disagreements, disputes. Right, whatever, your, your suggestions for other people on how we move forward. We had an election here recently, and what is the impact of the election on some of these uh, challenges that you face, and where do you see this heading? Do you have any, any perspective on that and where do you see us? What are, are there opportunities as well as challenges that uh, are now in front of us? Right, well thanks uh, Mark. So, um, you know, I, certainly for the U.S., um, 
the election was not good news for those people who believe in the ACA. Um, the the uh, research is clear uh, that in the U.S. Um, the ACA has resulted in fewer people who are uninsured. Um, and I, I can certainly just myself as a clinician testify to the number of people who come who came in after the ACA to say, I used to be treated, my medicines ran out, when I lost insurance, now I'm, I got Medicaid um, and I'm here, uh, and we were able to reinitiate them. So the call for the you know, dismantling of the ACA um, is very bad for us uh, and very bad for my patients. Um, that said, um, we are, I feel, survivors. We, are, we need to be advocates for our patients. We have to figure out how in what may not be good conditions, how to ensure that they have what they, they need. Um, one piece of uh, positive uh, experience I've had is uh, in Los Angeles, one of the uh, challenges I had when I came is that Los Angeles has a board of five supervisors. One of the supervisors who, incredibly nice person, incredibly smart, doesn't believe, didn't believe, doesn't believe that the system should provide care to people who are undocumented. Um, that's his view. Uh, my own sense of him is if he were behind a line of a undocumented person who wasn't getting care, he himself would pay their bill. But from a political point of view, his view was they're, they're not here legally in this country, we shouldn't provide care for them. That was his view. Uh, he was in the minority in the LA board, which meant that the LA system, mine, provides care to people who are undocumented and something I'm very proud of. Uh, we have no different lines, we have no different systems, we provide the same level of care to undocumented people that we do to people with insurance. What I was able to work with him about is I said to him, look, I understand what you politically believe, but if I don't provide primary care for people who are undocumented, they're still going to show up in the emergency room. And when they show up in the emergency room, it's going to cost you more than it would cost you if I provided them high quality care. And so he and I were able to agree that he didn't, that while he had a particular political belief, he did not want to be spending money needlessly. And that was how he understood that there was no way to avoid the cost of emergency care of people who were undocumented. And in fact, he, throughout the United States, even in counties, cities that don't provide regular care to undocumented, there's always emergency care of, at some level. So uh, I'm hoping that, that Mark, in going forward, that, because that's the only way we can go, uh, we have to go forward. What we have to do is find the arguments that people understand. I'd also say that in the eras that we had before the ACA, um, many of uh, people who tended to be more conservative about government and others providing care supported the community centers, the federally qualified health centers in the US. Um, they found, people who were conservative found that a more acceptable solution. Okay, so if that's their solution, then I'll, then I'll work with that. And then, then I'll need in my system to try to evolve to make sure I can provide the specialty care needs. And uh, people are at least seeming to back off a little bit from the dismantling language. Um, certain changes I, I think will, will happen. I, uh, you know, if I were predicting uh, the U.S. situation, I'd say it will mean the end to the individual mandate. It will mean the end to the employer mandate. And probably those two things sink the exchanges. Uh, but it's also true that the largest 
uh, expansion from uninsured to insured in the U.S. was the Medicaid expansion. Even, even though it wasn't adopted in all the states, it still accounts for the largest changes uh, that uh, greater than being able to keep your kids on until 25, uh, maybe the idea that insurers cannot discriminate against people with chronic diseases. So, you know, we'll, we'll go forward. Hi, Mitch. Uh, thank you very much for that very stimulating discussion. Um, my name's Paul James. I'm at the University of Iowa. Hi, Paul. You mentioned um, that Willie Sutton robbed banks, and that was because that's where the money was, and hospitals are that place where the money is. You then mentioned also that primary care then needs to help with reform. I think one of the challenges faced by some of us in large health systems that are trying to do health reform, we find that the finance folks, the people who are controlling where investments occur, are very used to the last 50 years of, of building hospitals, capitalizing, using capital to, to build structures, as opposed to building processes of healthcare delivery. We find that these people also focus intently on supporting profit centers that we euphemistically in academic health centers call centers of excellence. Um, and my question for you then is how can we engage in discussions, who do we partner with to ensure that A, these finance people are being adequately educated uh, about investing in processes and maybe what is the research that needs to occur to help us have these conversations with people in the executive suites? Well, well very good. Thanks, Paul, for, for the question. Uh, I mean, I, it's self-serving if I say that I wish more health systems were run by primary care doctors, right? That would be self-serving. Uh, but I wish it were true, uh, right? I mean, there's no reason why health systems have to be run by hospital people, right? I, I mean, I, my hospital background uh, is fairly limited, right? But I, I understand what patients need, and that makes me, I think, qualified to run a, a health and hospital system uh, in Los Angeles. I think the places you have to go, and I, I, I've experienced all the same pushbacks you have, um, is you have to look at where they lose money. And the, the biggest place that hospital systems lose money is in extra hospital days and hospital admissions for which they don't get paid for. And so you have to figure out which of those days, and I've actually done those exercises with hospital people where I take their, uh, their denied days and I calculate for them how much their denied days cost them. And then I look at, at you know, what admissions they didn't get approved and what those cost them. I do, uh, there, there is a very good measure of unnecessary ED use, uh, where you can look at each, each uh, emergency room visit. Uh, but I think, Paul, for it to really happen, and this is why the next you know, years may not be as good as I had hoped, is what you need is for in our case, the federal government, to make more of the payments that way. See, as long as they keep paying the hospital for each CT scan that is done, no matter how pointless, it, it's much harder for us. To the extent that more of the, the payments were, are about value, then it's a lot easier for us, and that's why I put in the slides about MACRA, and then that's why I didn't talk about it that much, because when I, did, when I wrote the talk two weeks ago, uh, I was really feeling like, you know, the Burwell, who is essentially out of a job, right, in, in days, you know, has been talking about how much of, this, of the reimbursement she wants to put on value. And that was the conversation that would really get us into the boardrooms to say, you're going to lose money. We can help you. We can keep these patients out of the hospital. We can, we can get you better outcomes. So we'll, we'll have to do our best. Question on, on your right. Where are you? 
right here. A disembodied right. voice. Uh, uh, yeah, right. David. I have the, the eyesight of the average 57-year-old, yeah. which means I can't see anything. I get it. I get it. I'm David Hahn. I'm the director of a practice-based network in Wisconsin, and I had a couple of related questions relating to the lack of access uh, for primary care in L.A. County. The first question was, uh, what's the role of the federally qualified health care systems that I know exist in L.A. County? And have you ever uh, talked to the practice-based network that uh, kind of brings all of them under one umbrella? Uh, Do you see any role for, the, for uh, either a PBRN or for the, all of those systems as uh, places where your patients can access primary care? Uh, so, I mean, most, most primary care doctors in Los Angeles seeing people in the safety net are actually not employed by me. Um, L.A., in what I think of as a very bad decision uh, about 20 years ago, when faced, and it, it fits well with Paul's question. So 20 years ago, Los Angeles was in the grip of a financial crisis. Um, the, the health system had developed a huge deficit. Uh, and so to save money, they fired all the primary care doctors and closed the health centers, right? Because after all, you can't close the hospitals, right? That's where people who are really sick, right? Or that was their philosophy. Um, so we work heavily with the other, the other systems, generally providing them, the safety net people, uh, with the specialty care. Another thing that, that we do is uh, I don't try to compete with those uh, providers who can say take care of people on the exchange or Medicare. You know, I, I, I try to care for all those people who are uninsured and my share of the Medicaid um, so that the, the other patients I feel, not that we would send them away, but the other patients have other options and so we don't try to attract them. Go ahead. Yeah, so thanks a lot. My name is Matthew Minier. I'm from Laval University in Quebec City. And um, I'm assuming that in a safety net kind of population, you have a lot of people who have mental health and addictions problems. And I was just curious about uh, what's the state of delivering mental health care or addictions care in primary care in Los Angeles? I had read about the Mental Health Services Act and how that was raising money for community-based mental health services, but I don't know if that's something that you were able to capitalize on. I don't know what the state of that is right now. So. Do you want to talk about, about where things were when you came and where things are now? Very good. Uh, thank you, Matthew. And, and uh, Mark, in his kind introduction, mentioned that well, I ran the health service system part alone in, in Los Angeles for f about four and a half years. In the last year and a half, we've put the health departments together, health, physical health, mental health, and substance treatment as the first step to trying to do that. Um, just the year of conversation uh, about mental health and physical health was fascinating. Uh, not, uh, it won't surprise any of you how much, how siloed the systems are. Uh, and one of the funny comments that I got that any of you who do clinical work will laugh at is that uh, when I was talking about the needs for uh, mental health services in primary care patients, the mental health people would say, Oh, Mitch, well, you know, yes, I know you, you have patients with mild depression and anxiety syndromes, and, you know, we, you know, we're willing to try to provide care. It's like, no, I take care of people who have schizophrenia and are psychotic and would never go to a mental health provider. But there was absolutely no awareness of that. They felt, well, we're the specialty mental health provider, and they didn't accept at first the idea that many people with really serious mental illness won't enter that system um, because of stigma or because they don't, they're paranoid or because they don't, they don't conceptualize their, their uh, life that way. Uh, the, the opposite pressure um, is also true, which is that when you look at the data on the uh, mortality of people with serious mental illness, it's terrible. They, on average, live 20 years less than people without serious mental illness, and they don't die primarily of suicide. They die primarily of risk factor issues like obesity and sedentary lifestyle and lack of social connectedness, drug use, which you mentioned, 
uh, the side effects of the medications, um, and the fact that they don't go to the doctor. So um, we are now working on what does this mean? And we can now, for the first time, do e-consults with psychiatry, which I couldn't previously do. So now one of my primary care doctors can ask a psychiatrist. Uh, we can do direct referral for the first time. We can't yet, the, the psychiatrist cannot yet see our medical diagnoses, but soon they'll be able to. Um, so, and we, we're choosing to go, and you know, I think this is consistent with the literature. Uh, we're, we're not choosing a single model of how we're going to do coordinated care, but we're, we're basically sort of trying all. We're trying, we're putting some primary care clinics into mental health facilities, uh, we're putting mental health clinicians into primary care. Um, we're creating programs specifically meant for people who have both illnesses. Uh, substance illness uh, has been a huge underfunded, under-resourced area. Uh, it is set in LA and in other places in the US to expand under a Medicaid provision that starts next July whether that's going to be derailed by the election, I'm not sure. Um, but um, I know that many people's health um, is deeply compromised by, last, by not getting enough treatment. So that's an area. I think you have the honor of the last question to close our session. Uh, Ed Bougeau, I'm a solo practice primary care physician in Western North Carolina. And I flew into Washington, D.C. on the eve of the election night to attend the patient-centered primary care collaborative of which I'm an advisory board member. And Paul Grundy was there, who many in people in this room know. He made a statement that uh, struck me. He said that for every dollar that we put in primary care, we save the system $13. And I just wanted to say, regardless of all the political rhetoric and all of the other stuff that's out there, primary care and patient-centered medical homes and patient-centeredness is not going to go away. It's the right thing to do, and we will prevail. I can't imagine a better way to end the session. Thank you.